Texas Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, and Giovanni. Welcome to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. Thank you for joining us today. We're here today to talk to my good friend and host of the Clandestine podcast and spyculture.com, Tom Secker. And we are going to take some time today to talk about his new documentary that he made alongside Matt Alford and Roger Stahl, Theaters of War. And it also connects to Tom's book, A National Security Cinema, which I hope everyone who's listening to this has a copy of. Tom, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, Henry. Thanks for having me back on. It's great to be talking to you again. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a while. We got to get back in the swing of this. There's a lot more propaganda to, to, to shit on. <laughs> and we may hear from, we may have Matt to join us a little bit later on. We can chat with him a little bit about the documentary and such, but just to get us, get us started here. Can you talk about how the documentary was conceived, the, uh, its relationship with, with the book and just your overall impressions of, uh, of the creation? Okay. So. Yeah, like you said, this came out of the book National Security Cinema, which is now five years old. Yeah, it's just over five years old. I think we're actually talking a couple of weeks after its fifth birthday, you could say, which Matt and I wrote way back in 2016-17. That was the first main like creative output from Matt and me collaborating because we'd been working together on a lot of my freedom of information requests into the whole military entertainment liaison office and other government agency liaison offices as well. So we'd be bouncing ideas off each other for a while. We'd always talked about a documentary or some kind of film adaptation of the book because we knew that can reach a different audience, but it was a question of, do we have the production ability? How would we get any kind of funding for that? And then Roger came along sometime in 2018, I think it must have been. And Roger has made documentaries before. He's written multiple books about this and related subjects. Certainly he's written a lot about war media in general. He loved the book. He wanted to do some kind of documentary, not necessarily a version of the book. That may have actually been where the idea started, mm. was some sort of adaptation of the book. But in the however many years since then this thing was it was in development for over a year before we even really got a, a map of what sort of film it was that we wanted to make and it's been through dozens of different edits over the last year and a half maybe two years before it came out but yeah instead of an adaptation of national security cinema what we ended up with was a whole lot built on top of that because for one thing roger and others who helped make the film interviewed a whole bunch of interesting people. So on top of the various experts, the academics, the people who've been writing about this for years, we also had a bunch of highly original stuff. People, people who either hadn't been interviewed before or had never been asked these questions before. Roger and Matt also made a number of visits to different archives. So the whole, <laughs> like the paper trail basis for the story and for the like the revelatory parts, the new information, that is just so much larger than what was possible back when we wrote National Security Cinema. So the whole thing is, like I say, it's so much bigger than where it started. It started out as, uh, let's build something that's a documentary version of National Security Cinema. And what we've ended up with is something that's really pushed the boundaries I guess, not just with what you can do with an educational documentary, which is fundamentally what theaters of war is, but also with this whole area of research, we really laid out not just the story of primarily the Pentagon in, in Hollywood, although there's quite a lot of CIA stuff in there too, but like, why did we not know this before? How did we find all this out? That side of the story we also told in this. As well as some of the, if you like, human interest stuff, the impact on real people's lives, that comes up time and time again in the documentary. And that's a very deliberate choice that we made. We said there's no point just making an educational documentary. There's no point just making a 90-minute PowerPoint presentation with a voiceover. You know what I mean? Sure. For people to understand 
why does this matter? Why is this more than just a bunch of stuff about how movies get made? You have to ground it in reality. And the reality is constant war. The reality is mass surveillance. The reality is human rights abuses on an astonishing scale. The reality is institutionalized sexual assault and racism and all of these other things. And that's why this matters. And we were really pushing, well, not necessarily pushing, it's not like Roger was in any way resistant to this, but I'm just saying in the development and editing phases, we really wanted to draw that out. We went to great pains to keep re-editing and poor Roger, bless him, put in an enormous amount of work. The majority of the credit for this film really belongs with Roger, not with me or Matt or Seb or anyone else who was involved, to be honest. And he put in an enormous amount of time in making sure we could situate all of this, the investigative revelatory material in a real world that has some serious problems and that these films and these TV shows are either covering up these problems or helping to normalize them. And either way, that's a pretty terrible thing. So I'm very happy with what came out. This is <laughs> probably the creative thing that I'm most proud of aside from my own website, which is something I've been doing for 10 years and is enormous and extensive and far bigger than any one documentary could ever be. But yeah, it's probably second only to my website. Since we're going to be talking about Top Gun Maverick today and also probably a little bit on, on Top Gun, are there any other films that stick out as much as Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick in terms of fitting this mold that they've created for films in terms of the whitewashing certain things, leaving out the enemy if they possibly can, only positive U.S. depictions, that kind of thing? Yeah. I would say the Transformers franchise, because the enemy in that is an enemy that doesn't exist. It might as well be anonymous. It's just some alien robots that we don't even really know that much about. So it's just an enemy onto which you can project whatever metaphor you like. To a certain extent, the superhero movies. Yeah, the, Mar uh, it's Mar the Marvel Cinematic franchise. Universe absolutely would fit in this, yeah. Because they are fantastical. They are fantasy movies, but they're in our world. You know what I mean? There's a lot of stuff in them that is clearly, this is the real world that we live in. It's just got superheroes and aliens and monsters and Thanos and all of that in it. And we've talked before about Iron Man and we pointed out they never actually say that he's in Afghanistan and that these terrorists or militants or whatever are effectively the Taliban or some offshoot of the Taliban, something like that. They never really name them as such, but everyone knows who they are. So, again, it's a bit like in Top Gun, both Top Gun movies. Those are the ones that immediately spring to mind from the last 20 years or so. They're the ones that we really drew out in theatres of war. They keep coming up time and again as we look at different examples of different things and how they've played out. Those are certainly two franchises that the military have had their teeth in a big way and which aren't the conventional... They're certainly not war movies, are they? No. They're not the conventional sort of Hollywood propaganda that people might think of. They're the kind that will probably be so much more effective precisely because it has a vaguely defined enemy. So it's just a sort of a thing to hate, a thing to despise and want to see destroyed. And fundamentally, isn't that what this is about? It's not necessarily sometimes with something like Jack Ryan season two, which we've discussed before at some length. That was a weird example of the CIA and DOD effectively promoting a real life CIA operation to overthrow the government of Venezuela in real time as that operation was going on. That's not something that happens all that often. It's only really things like Jack Ryan and Homeland that do that. Whereas the big screen, the big cinema productions, it's about laying down emotional and psychological patterns. It's not so much about telling you who the enemy is. It's just that there is an enemy out there and you need to fear them. And you need to look on these people as the heroes and not even these people, these institutions as the heroes who are going to deal with this problem for you. That's as long as people come away believing in that pattern of thought and feeling those feelings over and over again, they know it doesn't really matter. We can just tell them who the enemy is at any moment, the designated enemy. 
and they'll buy into it because they've already got that psychological shape in their minds. So you don't have to keep saying it's the Russians, though they have also been doing that. You don't always have to do that. You just have to keep telling them there is an enemy out there. The world is complex and dangerous and we need these institutions to protect us because otherwise we're done for. And then you can then just tap into that and say, oh, today it's Syria. Tomorrow it's Yemen. Next week it'll be Russia. Week after it'll be the Chinese. Doesn't matter. They can, there's other ways of handling that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, as long as they've created this suitable framework that allows people's minds to immediately register who goes in what column and that it completely tosses aside any rational criticism or anything that might not be agreed upon between different, uh, different viewpoints. I realized this morning that I'm studying the battles of Fallujah right now from the Iraq mm -hmm. war, and I've never watched American Sniper, which I'm sure most people remember the film with Bradley Cooper portraying former Navy SEAL and all-around piece of shit Chris Kyle during his time fighting in Fallujah. And I don't want, I don't want to watch it, but I... Nor have I, I, Henry, man. I remember thinking about it a lot when it first came out, and this was a little bit before I started working on any war things, and I just never got, a, got around to it. But the portrayal there, I think that's the only one I've found that, or I've noticed from going through different things, looking for different war movies on Fallujah, that they actually have a story in there. I don't, I'm sure most of it's bullshit. I know it's about Chris Kyle and it was infinitely full of crap about his many kills and his missions as a seal. Uh, but in some ways that also makes him the perfect person to promote in that way, because he is very, or what, excuse me, was very adept at bullshitting people in that way, giving a, a little bits here and there that tell people that they're really learning something when he could just mm -hmm simply be lying his ass off. But I, uh, but no, I've been, it's interesting to know now just that the, that we're all just idiots to our government. We're all in this, in this particular way that it, that we, most people are willing to get onto the side of that, that the government lies to us about any number of other things, but that when it comes to this fictional world, that people give it a much longer leash on the, that uh, set of ideas that is, oh, it's a movie, whatever. And then that kind of plays into both sides of it a little bit. Here's a question. If you actually had a lot of TV dramas, The Wire is a great example that studies government institutions and portrays them how they are with all the lies and the corruption and the incompetence and the dysfunction and all the different problems that they have. Do you think people would have a much more realistic understanding of government institutions and when they lie and when they screw up and when they're corrupt and when they're conspiring and when you know all this different stuff rather than just a sort of generic oh yeah they steal our money and they we don't really get a good quality of service back for it but deep down we do need them because it might be aliens or illegal immigrants or criminals or russians or whatever but there's something out there that we've yeah. got to be afraid of. There's something out there we've got to dehumanize and be angry and hostile towards. And we don't want to have to deal with that ourselves because we're busy playing Fortnite. So um, I guess that's what the government's for. Whereas if you actually had, like I say, more realistic and skeptical depictions of the government as a whole, so it wasn't this contrast between a rather, I guess, cynical view of government in general, but a very heroic view of the security state, because that's so skewed. They don't trust these parts of the government, but you've got to trust these parts. Yeah. Why? <laughs> There's nothing coherent about that view. Come on. If you're going to be skeptical of the whole lot, I say, that's what I am. Our, our pop culture has all sorts of weird skews and biases in it. And a lot of that is down to which organizations, whether corporate or governmental or whatever, are actually in there influencing this and shaping it in order to push their own agendas. And some of that, some of them are doing it far more effectively than others. And as a result, millions upon millions of people believe a bunch of stuff that's, like I say, incoherent gibberish, really. But what I was, I guess what I'm getting at is that it's not just that the government thinks we're all idiots. It certainly does. But it's that they know deep down that the thing that drives what people do, which is the most important thing, is how they feel. Yeah. It's not necessarily what they believe, because their beliefs can be 
I guess all of our beliefs to some extent are going to contain contradictions and be incoherent and be a bit fractured and messy around the edges and be subject to change when we learn new things. And we are somewhat confused, all of us, as to quite what the hell is going on. So like I say, what really drives action is how people feel. Well, what influences how people feel better than an emotionally loaded narrative presented in a really dramatic, engaging way? I don't think anything has a greater influence than that, other than the actual circumstances of people's lives. But I'm talking in terms of propaganda. I'm sure, talking sure. in terms of if you're someone who wants to influence how people feel. I actually think this is more effective than any of that stuff like the Cambridge Analytica or any of those other social media companies targeting ads at that old sort of targeted audience analysis and targeting these political ads at people because they think they fit into one of these however many 62 different psychological boxes because it's about something more fundamental than that. It's about what gets rewarded. It's about cause and effect. It's about where is the threat coming from and who's going to deal with it. It's about what actions do they take and who's are successful. Is it the people who are trying to find a diplomatic or creative solution or is it the people who just go gung-ho with violence? In Hollywood, 99% of the time, it's the violent ones. They're whose actions get rewarded. And so that tells everyone in a situation like this, when you feel frightened and angry, the answer is violence. And that, like I say, that, emotional association, that psychological association is a more powerful driver of people's actions and what they will tolerate on their behalf in terms of the actions of the government than probably any other form of propaganda that exists. And so that's, like I say, why it matters. That's why this is so important. Yeah. And I know for me, and we've talked about this many times that there, that as someone who watched a ton of films growing up, that, that who's my old man's favorite film to this day is Die Hard. And I totally... And one of yours and one of mine. <laughs> yes, no, it's a great movie. It really is. But the but that the narratives and the ideas that came across in that before I actually started studying the topic separately from the creation of the films, it allows people to convince themselves that they have an understanding of things they have zero understanding of because of the pomp and circumstance of it, how everything looks, how everything fits. The fact that a guy who is dressed like a general gets thought of as a general in our minds and that I carried all that with me into being, being in the military and probably for a few years after that, before, before studying it, I wanted to, you had mentioned earlier about normalization and mm. that a great portion of the censorship that happens in terms of dealing with the entertainment liaison offices and such is a, their ability to simply deny support to movies that they don't want to, that don't have the views that they want. And in essence, the story doesn't continue that there is no, there's no film from that. I know you've told me about lists and lists of them and that uh, in addition to that, you have, if someone chooses to still make the same film that they wanted to without DOD support, but in need of military hardware, 13 days by Oliver Stone is a good example that they have to go to really great lengths. And of course, to get that equipment, to use it, I read about having to repaint airplanes to make them look like Americans. I think the mm -hmm. days was the Philippines or uh, yeah, yeah, it was the Philippines doubling yeah. for Cuba so, and the Filipino air force doubling for the U S F. <laughs> But that it, that we, so many movies never see the light of day just because that their depiction requires this certain equipment or know-how or whatever. And the military by saying no means that story can never move forward as written. There are films. This is one of the most important aspects of the, like you say, the way that the whole way the censorship works is that there are certain things that they simply don't want you to know about, or at least for a long period, didn't want you to know about, whether that's shifted in recent decades. On some subjects, it absolutely has. On other ones, they're still very censorious. But yeah, you take something like Iran-Contra. There are actually at least a couple of dozen movies made in some way influenced by Iran-Contra. But the only ones that went and tried to get government support got shot down, and most of them were never made. And the ones that were made obviously didn't have the production value that they would otherwise have attained. 
the only one I can think of that actually like gained government support was one called Tough But Deadly from 1995, which I don't know if it was straight to video, but it certainly wasn't far off straight to video if it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And it's a really wonderful, bad comic action movie. And it features the army smuggling drugs through a, uh, an army base and stuff like that, which is why it got rejected by the Pentagon. But the CIA, for some reason, had the filmmakers in and were willing to talk to them. And there are actually a couple of shots of Langley in there and stuff like that. But that's very much an outlier. And that's, I think, a mistake, basically, that they made. Um, but yeah, yeah, there are several, just in, in terms of Iran Contra movies, there are several that would have been made that in some cases had big stars and big budgets and big studios behind them. And the Pentagon just said no. And in some cases, they pursued it more heavily than that. Um, they would go when the filmmakers would then go and talk to another Navy or another Air Force, if that was a friendly one, particularly if it was a NATO country, the Pentagon would reach out to them and say, yeah, we'd rather you didn't support this movie either. We'd just rather this movie didn't get military support because we think we can kill it. And I remember that, you remember that online Navy conference? We feature Mm -hmm. a bit of it in Theatres of War where Roger's grilling the guy over Lone Survivor. One of the other questions that Dennis Moynihan, who was Navy Chief of Information for quite a while and therefore de facto head of their whole public affairs PR operations, um, one of the questions that one of the people who was watching this online conference asked him was, have you ever had to kill a movie? Has there ever been a movie that you just had to stop getting it from getting made? And he sat there and ummed and ahed a bit and said, no, I don't remember as there actually being one during his time as head of Navy Chief of Information, which very much strongly suggests they can do this, they do this. He just couldn't remember one in that moment. (laughs) (laughs) Because he's maybe getting on a bit in years. He's retired now, so (laughs) you know what I'm saying? Uh, At any point say, oh, no, we don't do that. We don't kill movies. We're not a censorship program in Hollywood stopping movies from getting made because they're saying things that we don't want them to. He said, no, he basically just said, yeah, we do that. But one isn't coming to mind right now. I'm not sure if we did that when I was there. (laughs) (laughs) Which is kind of an astonishing thing to say, but it's how many people were actually watching that online conference. So I guess he thought he could get away with it. Or maybe it's just retired military types. They tend to loosen up a little bit and say some things that maybe they shouldn't. People can interpret that a number of different ways. But you know what I'm saying? That They are absolutely doing this. There are loads of movies that never got made because they depicted the Iraq war in a way they didn't want, that they had a subject like um, the military liaison missions. This is a great one. In the 1980s, someone was trying to make a movie about the military liaison missions, which were a kind of military intelligence exchange program with the Soviet Union that took place in Germany. So you'd have some Soviet military intelligence officers coming over to West Germany and talking to primarily Americans, and you'd have some American ones going over to East Germany and having a look around and having some discussions and whatever. And this was some kind of rapprochement. This was some kind of diplomatic exchange as much as anything between these two militaries that were otherwise very hostile towards one another. And they went to the Pentagon and said, this is our script, this is our story. And they said, no, we're not going to do any film that has the military liaison missions as a central feature of the storyline. We don't want people to know about this. We don't want people thinking about this. We don't want people conceiving of the Cold War in that way. Maybe if people were making films like that a bit earlier and the Pentagon was helping them get made, they had good production values and they looked all nice and they were nice and compelling and engaging and realistic, maybe the Cold War wouldn't have lasted as long. No, I agree with you. I, there, uh... How many people even now know about the MLMs? Hardly anyone. They're not yeah. a like, commonly known part of Cold War history, but they went on for quite a while, and they're important. And they represent something that would make people think differently about the Cold War, that would make them understand that period and what was actually going on there and what that geopolitical squabble was really all about a bit differently. And like I say... If you could make a film which has an emotionally engaging narrative that makes people feel differently about this as well as think differently, that's a very powerful thing. And so the fact that the Pentagon was saying no to that possibility, that they were terrified of people feeling that way about the Cold War, I think it speaks volumes. 
and the, like I say, the fact that hardly anyone even knows about those missions now. So that's partly because no one ever made a film about it. If someone had loads of people that know about it because they would have seen the film. But that's how they learn about history. It certainly isn't in classrooms. No, it's common among Americans that if we're learning about studying or studying about something, we inevitably watch the movie about it, depending on how close the movies actually got to that particular thing. But we treat it as a historical document, not uh, not DOD product placement. It actually has value to it. I remember my grandfather taking me to see Saving Private Ryan in the theater. I had told him I was going to plan to join the army. And he, I think that he used it as a, a sobering instrument for me. He wanted me to understand that, that what I'd seen from recruiters or another more pro-military movies was not exactly it. And the, although Saving Private Ryan can't be seen as any kind of, of a anti-war film or anything like that, it, there is some honesty to it. There is some things in it that are, that are truthful and do make some of those connections. So I could see it would be easier for somebody to grab onto those things, but that's what Americans do that we, we don't, we're not, we don't understand that between the movies and the history, that there are however many layers of bullshit in there. I wrote an op-ed in high school when somebody, someone we had watched saving part, a very short portion of saving private Ryan in history class. I don't remember what the context was. But parents and people were all up in arms and it was just about the violence level. There was no other question about it, no other issue with it. And I mm -hmm. felt very strongly that we should be able to watch those things. But I was working on the basis that I was dealing with someone that was something that was as truthful as it could possibly be and certainly did not have the fingers of the military or the intelligence community into it puppeting around ideas and moving in places where it makes it easier for people to perceive their own storylines, their own points of propaganda. And history is, uh, no matter how you experience it, it is narrativized. You are given protagonists and antagonists. You are given cause and effect. Like I say, you are given whose actions and values are rewarded, who mm -hmm. succeeded, who triumphed and who failed and why. And yeah, sure, you can argue about the accuracy of any history that you've ever read or watched or seen anywhere that's partly just the nature of history to be honest it's a sure, complex sure. topic but i know what you're saying there are some things that are outright outright lies and they get institutionalized and repeated over and over again and recycled because they're useful lies because they're useful delusions in many ways and so when you substitute an effort to actually understand a historical event or series of events. When you substitute in a movie for that, and that movie has been in some way shaped and influenced by one of the main, yeah, protagonists in those events, you have to wonder why. And you have to wonder how useful is this film now as a historical document? Because it's one of those things that, hit, that Hollywood gets bashed for a lot from all sorts of different angles. It's not just military veterans that shit on movies for getting oh, sure, details sure. wrong. It's scientists, it's historians, it's everybody. And to some extent, fair enough. But when it comes to things like the origin story of your nation and your people, that's something a bit more profound than whether they got a uniform or a bit of, instead of actually getting the right term for something, they just slapped in a bit of techno babble. Yeah, okay, those things matter, but they don't matter as much. Sure. <laughs> they certainly don't matter as much as framing an entire people's image of itself. You mentioned the censorship of violence. This is something that comes up in almost every single censorship bureau on the planet, every culture ministry, every government censorship bureau, or whether it's a government or non-government one, doesn't really make much difference. They're all obsessed with the violence level and at what age people should be exposed to what level of violence. Well, isn't that normalization? Yep. That's saying, oh, at 15, you can't see this, but at 17, you can. That's inducting you into the world of violence steadily in a programmed way. Mm -hmm. Whether they think of it like that is what they're doing. And when your countries, when your governments, let's not really talk in terms of countries, because what the hell is a country? When governments are so violent, and yours is and mine is, and yet 
they're very much conditioning us and only exposing us to a certain amount of that violence and only at certain ages and only in certain contexts and only in ways that will have a particular emotional reaction or at least are liable to. That's very powerful. And the most important consequence of that is the continuation of the violence, the continuation of the infliction of suffering. It makes it easier for them to do it. So again, that's why this matters. Deep down, that's why we made this film. That's why we've all spent years working on this topic. That's why we, that's why Roger spent, I don't know how many hours re-editing this damn thing to try and make it as good as it could be. It's because these things matter. We're all actually, to some extent, moved and upset by all of this. And we don't think it's right. And it may not even be legal. But screw laws for the time being. It's simply not. And so when you have the kind of knowledge of something like this that we've developed, how can you not try and do something about it? How can you not try and produce something that has a counter effect? And that's one of the things that we hope for this documentary is that it has some kind of counter effect to this. It makes it easier for people to identify this and be more resistant to it. It might even piss people off enough to actually go and do a bunch of this stuff themselves and make their own counterculture to this that advocates different values than violence and domination and nationalism and militarism and technocracy and all of these themes that just come up again and again in these movies. Because it isn't just about what they're taking out, it's about what's getting put in there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that people ask a lot about because I get it, it's not just a censorship bureau, it's not just like some whatever Czech Communist Party going over your movie. And one of the biggest things that they put in there is extremely expensive and invasive and destructive technologies. That's one of the things they're always on at filmmakers. Oh, we would love the F-35 to be in this sequence. We'd love some F-18s in this bit. We'd love to show off the new Navy's littoral combat ship, which is a gigantic waste of money and doesn't fucking work. But according to Hollywood, it works beautifully because look at all these movies and TV shows it stars. And again, it makes it easier for them to do this. It makes it easier for them to spend enormous amounts of money on these things that don't work. And even when they do work are just horribly destructive, both to the environment and to nature and to everything good about the world. And to us, there is a self-interest here that we can't let hold of. We shouldn't just let go of, sorry, either. It makes it easier for them to do all of that. That's wrong as well. Because imagine what we could do with those resources if we weren't blowing them on pointless F-35s that still don't work 10 years after they were supposed to be perfected. So, again, all of this stuff matters. All of this stuff has enormous consequences. And it isn't just about war. It's about our lives. It's about who we are. It's about what we actually want to do with our societies and with ourselves. And when Hollywood is bastardizing that on behalf of a state which just constantly spies on us and routinely abuses us and is happy to just exploit us whenever it's expedient to them. Like I say, I can't just let that stand. We couldn't just let that stand. That's one of the reasons why so much time and effort has gone into not just the documentary, but everything that I and Matt, Roger and the rest of us have been doing. I'm offering quite rambling answers to your questions. I appreciate it. <laughs> you definitely contributed to one convert right here. And I'm sure that there are lots of people I know I've spoken to, to many of them who have found uh, your work and uh, to, a, to a lesser extent about your work, my work, just doing interviews with you and stuff, but uh, that place those questions for people so that as this moves forward, and they see those kind of things that they're not, it, it's not still being stuck into the amalgam of propagandizing that they've been put through by their government, that it, at least if they have to, they at least get a chance to say, maybe I'm going to think about this for an extra second, or maybe I'm going to ask myself, was that really true Did that bizarre thing that seemed great for the story, but did, that it, did it actually happen? The answer nine times out of 10 is no, it didn't. Yeah. Every once in a while. No, normally extraordinary stuff doesn't happen. That's why it's extraordinary, not ordinary. Let's, uh, let's move on to talk about Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick for a minute. Sure. But uh, before we do, just to, to bring us into the right context, 
Would you mind sharing a little bit with the listeners about the tailhook incident and how it fits into the story of Top Gun 2? Yeah, sure. In 1986, Top Gun comes out. Uh, it obviously promotes this heavy drinking, womanizing, party animal culture within the Navy, which was a very real thing for sure back then and to a certain extent still is now. And then a few years later, they were gearing up to make Top Gun 2. That It had been in some kind of development for a while, because obviously the first film was very popular, very commercially successful. They were always planning a sequel, and with provisional DOD approval and support. But then the tailhook scandal hit the news, and this was the story that at the, was it the 1991 tailhook mm -hmm. conference? I think, yeah, yeah which is a big naval and marine aviator conference. Lots of pilots go basically turning up to a big hotel in Las Vegas for a weekend. Is that it's unclear exactly how many people perpetrated a bunch of assaults, sexual assaults, harassment, gropings, all sorts of horrible behavior against dozens and dozens of women. A bunch of men got assaulted as well. And naturally. When this hit the headlines, it was a story that people hadn't heard before because the military had done so well at covering this up in the years prior, including with the help of Hollywood, that it caused a great upset to a lot of people. This wasn't how they wanted to think of their military. This wasn't how they <laughs> wanted to think of the men in the military behaving at its simplest. And so when the Top Gun producers turned up and said, yeah, that thing we've had in development, we're gearing up, we're getting ready to go now. The Navy said, no, there's just no way we're going to do anything that's going to remind people of tailhook right now. We're going to not going to do anything that looks like that because we can't, basically. The Overton window has shifted. The limits of conversation and moral values have shifted. People have a different perception of this now. Re the real world has actually taken over for once and had dictated to the PR people rather than the other way around. And as a result, Top Gun 2 just wasn't made. And I do wonder, could they not have rewritten it to make it more 90s appropriate or whatever? But no, evidently, the Navy just put the kibosh on it. And so they sh it got shelved. And it wasn't until 20 years later, 2011, 2012, something like that, that the whole thing got revived and resurrected. And obviously, they, one of the first phone calls that Jerry Bruckheimer made was to call up the military entertainment liaison offices and get a meeting with them. And from then until pretty much until the movie got edited and then finished, the military were involved. And so the, will you describe a little bit specifically about the process that the production has to go through? In, in terms of that they that the script changes have to be shown, uh, cuts of the film have to be seen before release, all of the different things that they have film creators go through to ensure that it has DOD's official stamp of approval. Actually, just one more thing has occurred to me about Tailhook is that one of the official investigations, I think it was a DOD inspector general, it may have been a congressional investigation, it was one of the two, one of the investigations into this flagged up this heavy drinking and womanizing culture as one of the reasons why this had happened. They even described a Top Gun culture. They attributed, in some ways, the actions of those rapey aviators to the actions portrayed in the movie. They even spoke of a Top Gun effect, like a copycat effect, that because they'd seen this on, on the movie screen, they thought it was okay which should tell you the power that these movies have, at least in the minds of the people in the military. Because whether or not you can actually attribute a criminal act or any wrongful, whether it's criminal or not, just any morally wrong act to something that someone saw in a movie or saw in a video game or something, I've always found that a slightly tenuous argument. Um, it certainly makes it more acceptable in their minds. But that is probably not the reason why they did it. But is there ever only ever one reason why someone does something? At any rate, you asked about the process. Top Gun 2, Top Gun Maverick, is quite a good example because 
they approached the military in 2012. They say they haven't even got a script yet. They barely even had any kind of story put together at that point. But they were interested in making this film, and obviously they needed military support. And Obviously, the military said, yeah, sure, we'd love to make another Top Gun. They seem to have completely forgotten about Tailhook by that point. I guess by that time, they actually had NCIS making specialist episodes of their series depicting the DOD dealing with sexual assault in a very mature and responsible and sensitive way. So they'd found other answers to that particular problem. But yeah, they went in, I think it was three years later, they sat down with Navy officials and discussed the story. And it seems at that point, they actually had quite a lot of impact because the script again hadn't really been written by that point. And so the Navy officials actually had some kind of input and influence on shaping the story, both the Navy and the DOD at that point. That doesn't always happen. It happened on something like Captain Marvel, happened on Top Gun Maverick, but sometimes they come in with essentially a completed script or at least a finalized story and a drafted script. And so you have to hand all of that over to the DOD and they, or the Navy, Marine Corps, whoever, and they have to review the whole thing. They have to go through it line by line and say, is there anything in this story we don't like? Is there anything in the characters we don't like? Actions, dialogue, people's names, people's jobs, any number of things that you could think of, all the different details about a movie that make up what that movie is. They can review it and say whether they approve it or not. And if they don't approve it, you have to change it or you have to go away. And you have to go and try and make your movie without them, which is a lot more difficult and invariably more expensive. And given that this is a commercial industry, this is Hollywood. If you go to the studio and say the movie's now going to cost 20% more to make, they might well crunch those numbers and say, okay, we're not putting the money into it anymore then. So it can just kill the movie from an industrial point of view. And the Pentagon are well aware of this. They're well aware of the power that acceptance or rejection has over the, not just the individual productions, but over the whole industry, because gradually word gets out. Producers and writers know if we're making some kind of military themed film, or at least something where we might need the military to help us make this, there's certain ground we can't touch. There are certain rocks we can't kick over in our story. There are certain themes we can't explore. There are certain characterizations we can't develop. Even before they get to the script review stage, there has still been some kind of influence quite often. Because even if it's a subconscious in the back of the mind of the screenwriter type of thing, it's still there. It still has an influence on the product. And so, yeah. They often send these lengthy emails or these sets of script notes, or sometimes they just sit down with them and have meetings, which doesn't leave much of a paper trail, which is always an annoyance to me that when they say, oh, we did have a massive influence on this script. It was all done in pre-production where we just sat down and went through the script in meetings and we didn't actually write down any of what we said. And it's okay. So that's because you didn't want anyone to know what you said. But yeah. It's an annoyance and a frustration to someone like me who actually wants the details and wants to be able to publish them. But even that tells you something. It tells you how powerful and influential they were over that particular movie. And like I say, on Captain Marvel, Top Gun Maverick, that's what happened. The somewhat more typical process would be something like Godzilla, the 2014 Godzilla, where they came in with a finished script, but it had to be changed. A lot, basically, they wanted changed on that. It was not just things like, well, in that film, there isn't any real direct confrontation between Godzilla and the military forces, the US military forces. That's essentially because the military wouldn't allow it. They said, the script as written has Godzilla kind of trampling all over our ships and our men and our vehicles and everything else. They actually totted it up at one point, how many F-18s and how many tanks. They were obviously reading this script, getting more and more infuriated and pissed off about just how many of them were getting <laughs> mowed down by this 300-foot lizard. And so they said, no, you just can't do this. You need to take this scene now. You need to change this. You need to make this less of a confrontation and more just like the military are trying to contain Godzilla, but there's no actual fighting between them and all this kind of stuff. They also took out a speech by Ken Watanabe, where he talks about, I think it's his grandfather's experience of watching the bombing of Hiroshima. And the Marine Corps notes on this said, if this is some kind of apology for the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or even an argument against doing it, then that's a showstopper for us, i.e. something we just can't allow. If you keep this in the script, we won't support your movie. 
And so that speech gets changed. It gets changed into some, the arrogance of man in the face of nature kind of speech. And that's a fundamental thematic shift, especially in a franchise which originated as an anti-nuclear weapons story, where Godzilla is a metaphor for the bomb. Godzilla's destructive power comes from nuclear power. Godzilla is the bomb. By the time of 2014, instead of Godzilla being the bomb and Godzilla being a, a, a representation of a very real world danger, it becomes, oh, no, no, nukes aren't a problem. Nukes are now, if anything, the heroes. They're how we deal with a problem like Godzilla. The guys and I love doing the podcast. Being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us. But we can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with somebody, anyone, who you think might be affected by it. Young people looking to join the military or parents advocating for one. Conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name. Advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment and the military creates for minorities and inflicts on minorities across the globe. Yeah, please share those with them. We get asked often what people can do to help support the podcast. One very powerful way is to help us grow and reach more people is to leave us a review. You can do that on iTunes, which is the best place to leave a review. iTunes does reach the most people these days. The next best place is Facebook. Go to our Fortress on a Hill Facebook page and look for the reviews tab. And finally, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping us for some of the podcast's expenses. Those who contribute $10 or more a month will be mentioned here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help us keep going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So let's bring out these honorary producers, and they are Fahim Shirazi, James O'Barr, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Caron, Zach H., Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds. Why I Am Anti-War Podcast, Korgoth, Rick Coffee, and the Status Quo Podcast. You are all the engine that helps us power the podcast. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me slash fortress on a hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great fortress merch. There's t-shirts, mugs, phone cases, and a whole lot more. And now let's get back to the podcast. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify, you name it. Anywhere you listen, we're waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a member at patreon.com. If you're not into doing a monthly payment, Think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. And now Matt's joined us. Hello. Hey, Matt. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for hosting me late. I've just come out of the middle of a local Shakespearean play, but I thought I'd pop in and say hi. How's the discussion? It's been great. It's been great. We, are, uh, we were talking about Top Gun Maverick and just the different points of inflection that DOD puts themselves in between the script and notes and changing all these different things and uh, tom had been mentioning about godzilla about the transformation that the godzilla re remake went through despite the fact that it did originate as a anti-nuclear 
film that it, that the character of Godzilla himself was a creation out of that. And there was a, a, therefore a direct criticism in that way that was completely sidestepped by the DOD when they came in to make their own changes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's so, it, it's uh, that's partly what makes it so important is that a lot of the issues that are in one way censored or dealt with or dampened down by the Department of Defense are, it's not, it, it's not just things that concern the US, US military personnel, the things that concern the whole world, the biggest issues in the world. Nuclear weapons are also aspects that are rewritten and rewritten systematically as well, not just in a film or two. That's what makes the issue. That's what makes this whole topic so important. It's just so pervasive. You've seen Top Gun, haven't you, Matt? Yeah, I went to go and see Top Gun 2, yeah, a couple of weeks ago when it first came out in Britain. Have you, did you see it as well? Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. I, I actually haven't seen it yet, but I think I get the gist. Yeah, you're not missing much. <laughs> I was quite surprised that it's got very good reviews. And so I was trying to keep an open mind about it for sort of entertainment purposes. But I, I didn't particularly think there was a great deal to derive from it in entertainment either, really. It's obviously very slickly made and structured and it looks really good. But I didn't, there wasn't really anything very surprising in it or it was just very unmemorable. It was quite bland, wasn't it? Yeah, bland. Yeah, really bland. Yeah. I, I'm trying to even remember how it ended now. I guess we won. <laughs> 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 I guess it was all fine after they bombed that Iranian nuclear plant, plant which no strategic mil military an analyst thinks at all. Everyone <laughs> thinks it would escalate at that point if, if the West was to do it. I can picture in my brain stacks of boxes of paper in Phil Strub's office that have these forms and like of nine out of 10 questions, the answer is already there. Verdict, US wins. So even Phil Strub can't go in and change the shit, but it works for any movie. I recently saw the undeclared war as well, by the way, Tom. Sorry if this is slightly uh, sidetracking you from your discussion. Please do push ahead with the yeah, no, right. I watched the Channel 4 series, The Undeclared War based at GCHQ and it was that was similarly teeth grindingly terrible mm -hmm. with Simon Pegg I love it the trailer says this is really serious or something like that and then it cuts to Simon Pegg <laughs> it's not very serious then is it the, the, guy, <laughs> the guy who does Shaun of the Dead and is pissed in all of his every single one of his movies for a laugh and then he's the head of, of G, some division within GCHQ it was just a it's kind of Another one of those series that reminds me of, do you remember The Agency, Tom, from 2001? Yeah. Which was yeah. one of those particularly early CIA ones that was made not just with the collaboration of the CIA, but basically it was entirely CIA. And so, of course, it was absolutely tedious. It was really mechanistic. It was all in jokes. And it was just a, just like an institution has just made uh, a corporate video. And, and this, this Simon Pegg, vehicle, which I'm surprised that he agreed to do, but I guess he thinks that he's now that he's been in Mission Impossible as a very well deployed joke character, he now seems to think in his arrogance, which was never something I thought I'd say of Simon Pegg, but it seems to have gone to his head and now he seems to think that he can be in espionage movies. And it's now, he was also in the rebooted Star Trek movies, but it's still a bad move for him. He should still be doing Shaun of the Dead. And then the movie where they get drunk in the in as many pubs as they possibly can. <laughs> That's what he should be doing. That is where his talent lies. It's true. Yeah, he should stay in his lane. Man. Yeah. Yeah. He's a sort of daft British Wally. And now he's just gone off into this trying to be all Hollywood with it. I think it all started when he did that movie Paul. Do you remember that one with where he meets Paul? Gaines? I love that movie. That's <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you may have loved it, but it was also the beginning of the end for Simon Pegg's quality <laughs> control went out the window, I think, around about that point. But anyway, that's another example of another sort of terrible by the numbers show, The Undeclared War, that is nevertheless competently enough made, attracts enough star appeal, looks authentic enough, so that there's enough people who go, oh yeah, that's all right, yeah, yeah, it's quite good, though. I'll watch that. And then it's, it's, you almost can't fail to make something competent because you've got the whole government behind it um, and the whole, you know, do you know what I mean? It's, it's a, it's a, 
it's just all a shame. The whole, the whole thing is a shame. Everything we're talking about is, is a great pity. <laughs> <laughs> the unknown war sounds the way that it's set up sounds a lot like the long road home. That it was yeah. that for anybody who's a veteran of Iraq, they could look at that and what is this shit? Yeah. But for the average person, there's too much to decrypt in that way. There's, they're just, they're going to yeah. accept it. They just, they're just going to, okay, what if that's the thing, even if they have questions about it. Yeah. So you may as well just say, oh, it must be roughly right. You, you know, <laughs> yeah. Trust, yeah. Let's trust Simon Pegg. Simon Pegg's an incredibly trustworthy, lovely actor and man and got a great public image. Oh yeah. I'm sure that's what it's like. I'm sure it is a little, it's the same with Kiefer Sutherland with 24. It's ah, yeah. I really want him to be in charge of killing people in this, in this country. He's got the best. When it comes to torture, he knows exactly when to do it. But of course, <laughs> in practice, in, in the real world, it, that is a, it's a terrible idea because it's very rare that you're going to get that kind of perfect decision making by anyone. It's definitely not going to be Simon Pegg who's going to be the person at the end of the, at the end of the apocalypse when someone is literally pressing that red button in the president's suitcase. It's not going to be someone as cool as Simon Pegg. <laughs> it's going to be some frazzled bureaucrat. He's just realized and that an issue government goes out path. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have to be that guy that, or uh, that Ron Howard's brother that gets cast in lots of his movies. And he was, remember when he was the analyst in Apollo 13. Yeah. Okay. And his, he really did seem like he would be one of those frazzled NASA workers. His face <laughs> just told you that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He would be well cast. He should be the guy who's head of GCHQ or whatever. Uh, yes. In this <laughs> terrible thing. But there are, there are lots of these, they're almost like procedurals, aren't they? So it's a bit like the detective equivalent of procedural TV series where you just make, potentially make hundreds and hundreds of the same formulaic thing. And everyone just likes watching it because they're thinking about sort of uh, that sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? It's like people like, yeah, yeah. It's about, reassuring what, what, what it just delivers just the did. same thing. Yeah. Or, or like the, all the murder team, homicide and detective programs that are on TV. It's just. It's vaguely comforting because you're like, oh, this is a bad, terrible thing that happened. And then someone came in and they sorted it all out. And yeah, and so it's all purient, prurient. And, uh, but yes, yes, it's bu bubble gum to the eyes, isn't it? That kind of TV. I don't think it really has any pretensions to be more than that. I want to go back for a sec to the, to the blandness that you guys mentioned about Top Gun Maverick and that the one thing we touched on a little bit, Tom, that the DOD and entertainment liaison offices, that in addition to all the other things that they do, that they push this Disney-fied evangelical Christian model of movies, the sailors who don't cuss, no nudity, of course, nothing cool or offensive, that the only thing that is tolerated enormously is favorable depictions of U.S. or the U.K., or whomever, and that heavy violence is almost always tolerated. Mm. This is one of the astonishing things about it, is that th they won't allow a drunken sailor to pick up a woman at a bar and have a one-night stand, but the following day, even though he'll probably have a hangover, he's fine to bomb an Iranian nuclear facility. It's a very strange set of values as to what's taboo and what isn't. And obviously, <laughs> there are reasons for that. <laughs> there are motives behind that as to they want the it's what Roger refers to as sanitization. They want a very clean image of the military. They don't want anything bloody or grungy or emotionally complex or anything that's going to leave a bad taste in people's mouths. But at the same time, they do want to promote war. And so it's very difficult to promote war when war is ninety percent horrible, grungy, dirty unpleasant, emotionally difficult, if not outright traumatizing, and so on. So how do you manage that? How do you walk that tightrope? And in a movie like Top Gun, <laughs> it is partly through the anonymization of the enemy. It's through the complete elimination of any suffering from this violence. We never actually see anyone suffer in the whole course of the movie, really. And through... Top Gun Maverick is a slightly different kind of movie because it's also wish fulfillment for people mm. within the military and with military veterans. It's like, a, oh, I wish military life was like this. I wish I could just go around being maverick and disobeying orders and stealing aircraft left and center and just saying what I want and doing what I want, but still being the hero. Yeah. And obviously that's not what military life is like. 
if you actually behave like Maverick, you would have got thrown out of the military about 25 times over just in the course of this movie. And so it is also a kind of fantasy wish fulfillment thing going on. But for the general public, it's more just a, like I said, a very bland, heroic depiction of the military that tells you just enough about the enemy that everyone knows who they are without them actually saying it. And so they can't get into any trouble. There's no controversy, but the messaging and the thematics still get across. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to think, I can just imagine someone must be listening to this saying, no wonder they don't like any of this stuff. They don't even get it. They don't even like that. They don't even get why Top Gun Maverick's the best film of the year. And I wonder what they, I wonder what they would say in response. But they'd probably be the same people who like Jack Reacher <laughs> with, with Tom Cruise in it being completely the wrong size. <laughs> I don't know. I could definitely enjoy those kind of things on, on some level. I don't want to be prudish, if that's not quite the right word, but it's prudish about military entertainment. I, I could think I can enjoy it. Certainly enjoy an Arnie, for, an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie back in the day. Don't mind a bit of that. But these are really... They're quite sort of slow watches. Don't get any surprises. I can tell you that. At one point, Tom Cruise, the only bit I can remember from it, actually, only probably three weeks ago, Tom Cruise gets a large bar bill and he doesn't think he can pay it until he goes back, until he goes to the bank first. That's some tension right there. And then they really have to pull up hard to get, get up over a cliff, I think. <laughs> I think yeah, he's right. Those are the two bits. Those are the two bits that I remember. I remember the oh, poor old Tom. You have to go to the you know, the cash point. Oh no, mate! I'm going to tap that overdraft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Massive dramatic stakes. <laughs> and didn't they? They built a new bar on one of the bases, didn't they, for the yeah. film? Yeah, yeah, the hard death bar which is like where about, I don't know, maybe 20% of the movie actually takes place. There's quite a lot of scenes in that bar. That was built on one of the naval air stations. And in fact, after they finished shooting, they, it was like stored in a hangar or a warehouse at this naval base because they thought they might want to use it for promotional things. They might have some sort of live TV event from the bar or whatever. Hmm. And then obviously all the COVID stuff happened and the movie got delayed and delayed. And so I think it's just been sat there. This dismantled bar set is possibly still just sat in a warehouse on a naval base with nothing happening with it. And I'm not sure if that's ever been resolved. It's a nice image in my mind of just how rotten this whole relationship is. That there is this set from what is probably going to be the biggest movie of the year, just sat in a naval warehouse probably getting leaked on because the roof hasn't been fixed recently and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice to think that this glossy, glitzy piece of military propaganda is now reduced to a bunch of wood and cardboard that's slowly getting moldy and damp in a Navy warehouse. That's a good, a good example for how flimsy all of the truth is in it, that but it's all pretend and put up and then it's taken back down and because it was never real to begin with. Um, and of course, all the various rules that they have to follow going to the different bases, ensuring they don't damage anything or they don't see things they're not supposed to. And if they see things they're not supposed to, that they sure don't film them. And if they film them, that they don't never get shown and on they go. Yeah, sure. And um, why has no one like chased this up? I found this out by reading through the documents and I can understand why people... I haven't figured that part of it out, but has no one like ordinary journalists chased this up? Because it's quite widely been reported like that this bar was built on the naval base. Has no one asked, is it still there? What's happened to it? Because it's, like, there's, I just mean out of those so many hundreds and hundreds of articles about this movie, no one's really chased that thing up. But then Top Gun Maverick is fascinating for the media's response to it because Matt said reviewers have been overwhelmingly positive. I'm not quite sure why, this movie didn't strike any massive chord with me. I can't see, it's not, I don't know, The Avengers in 2012. I can understand why everyone went crazy about that movie because it is actually a very well-made movie and totally delivers on what everyone would want from it. Whereas this is just, it's just a soft reboot of Top Gun. There's no surprise in it. There's nothing particularly funny about it. There's no real emotional high point. It just, it, it, it is like Top Gun procedural. 
almost. And so there's that element. Yeah, it wasn't really channel. I couldn't be like, because people have watched Top Gun 1 and enjoyed it on ironic levels or maybe just enjoyed it on nostalgia levels, but they didn't seem to really channel that kind of love or fan or fandom as, as much or as well as I thought they could. But then maybe there just wasn't a great deal to the original movie. Maybe, I'm, anyway, I slightly feel like I'm crapping on the Top Gun franchise from a great height. The, the point that I always come back to is that there are occasionally some good military movies, but also the other problem is that this is definitely not just about one movie. It's about these thousands and thousands of, uh, of movies and TV shows that, that we identify as being messed around with by the, by the national security state. But sorry. One of the other things that uh, me and Roger in particular picked up on was how many really bland articles there were about, oh, this is the military Hollywood relationship. Top Gun Maverick mm -hmm. is some kind of military recruitment vehicle. And it's, yeah, sure, it is a recruitment vehicle, but it's a bunch of other things beyond that. That is yeah. the only purpose of this. Yeah. And it's, you know, this is how the mainstream media often deals with this subject is they say, oh, we want to do a Top Gun's coming out, so we've got to do something about military in Hollywood. Okay, we'll dust off the same old crap that we wrote the last time we wrote this article, which was probably for Captain Marvel three years earlier. Maybe we'll phone up the DOD's office and get some quote from them um, so then we can pretend we've actually done some journalism. And then they just write the article. But at the same time, there have been a whole bunch of stuff, largely coming from Roger and myself, to be honest, or at least originating with us and then spreading out from there, that's much more critical, that's actually explained like what happened on this film, why this film is important, that this is a window into, as Matt says, a world of hundreds of movies, thousands of TV shows, many thousands of products, if we're including the whole security state in this conversation and things like that. And like Alan McLeod's article for Mint Press, that got picked up by a whole bunch of different places and inspired a bunch of other articles of its own, including pissing off task and purpose enough to like, they did this thing where they posted a reference to that article on their social media and encouraged their largely veteran audience to shit on the article and then took those responses and turned them into their own article. It was totally manufactured. It was fairly shameless on their part. But the fact that it's provoking that much of a reaction, the fact that they can't just let that stand shows that we're getting somewhere. It shows that, that what we're saying about this has reach and that it's challenging some people and it's forcing people to think and feel differently or at least to react in some way. If we were getting ignored, we probably would have given up by now, but we're not, we're provoking reactions. And that means, like I say, you're getting somewhere. And so Top Gun Maverick is not just a fascinating case study in terms of the movie itself and how the DOD were involved, but also in the reaction, the media conversation around the movie, I think has been quite illustrative of both the good and the bad about the discussion of this issue. I think that the task and purpose article put points to that next sort of way that they will try to defend this very layered onion. They will ultimately say, if they are challenged more about this, they will say is of course we've got the right to recruit. And that's what the, that article was basically saying. So what are these stupid academic types think that we're doing? Of course we're going to recruit, of course we're going to it's just a movie, but all of those kind of arguments. But actually that's not, that's only a very tiny part of what we're saying. The much, much more important thing is the systematic nature of this relationship and the fact that it's not just about recruitment. It is about rewriting history and rewriting present, the representation of the current ongoing institutions. And they know that it's much harder to, to, in some ways it's harder to defend that because inherently rewriting history sounds bad. People know that sounds bad, they're, they're, that rings alarm bells. But equally, they have got, if, so if we can break the back of that and say, look, if we could get to a point where enough people really recognize that it isn't just about recruitment, and that's not really what we're banging on about particularly, then the next thing would be, how are you rewriting history? And that's where the real challenge begins, because then we're going to, then you get into the real world. Is the US military representing Russia in an appropriate way or Iran in an appropriate way? Is the US military representing itself in an appropriate way, in an accurate way? And those are much bigger questions. And I think at that point, although I still think they'll be on relatively firm footing, I think it will just be starting to rock underneath them because you begin with that issue of why are you having to do this anyway? How? bad has your reputation become 
and I'm referring particularly to the CIA here rather than the military itself. But the CIA, as we know, had that problem going back to the mid seventies, where it started to become ass associated with assassinations and all sorts of unpleasant activity. And then again, in the 1990s, when there were some calls for it to be disbanded from the Senate. And so it's like, why are these organizations having to do so much to improve their reputations? Now, if you get to that point, then I think those institutions start to get on shakier ground. If that idea takes hold among, among the public. And we've actually seen a resurgence in recruiting numbers dropping precipitously in the last few years. And so that the, if they're having an effect, it sure isn't the effect that they want it to have in terms of the overall policies and getting, actually getting people in boots and making them into soldiers or whatever, in terms of joining the CIA, mm. that there's a certain amount of it that they just can't overcome no matter mm. what they put out there. Yeah. Yeah. And that struggle, it, it tells us something because there's no way that the, that's a result of the DOD in any way failing to work with Hollywood True. effectively, or certainly not on a small scale or anything like that. Their operations have only become larger over the last 10 or 15 years. So like Matt says, the question has to become, well, why is this so difficult for you? Maybe it's because of the horrible stuff. Maybe it's because of the horrors of these wars. Maybe people are actually realizing that and realizing, hang on, these institutions aren't great places to be. That's why less and less people are thinking it's a good idea to sign up, despite being bombarded with more messaging telling them to sign up than they've probably ever experienced before. And what? there is also a problem of, again, like Matt says, this isn't just about recruitment, but since that's what we're talking about, there is a problem of redundancy that because People have had a hundred years of movies telling them to sign up to the US military. And in this country, something like a hundred years telling them to sign up to the British military. After a while, that becomes a bit stale. It becomes background noise. How many Transformers movies can you watch and still be emotionally affected by them since they're all the same? You know what I mean? Yeah. There's only so many times you can hear something and it still actually chimes with you. Eventually it does. You do just start to tune it out. And one might ask the question, have it has this massive expansion, particularly over the last 30 years in the whole government entertainment liaison office phenomenon. Is it actually starting to have a counter effect that they've actually gone too far, that they're doing this too often and too much? And so this me these messages aren't getting through as effectively anymore because it's just, oh, that's just what you hear in a movie. That's just what you're on a TV show. So from a normalization point of view, it's great because then it does just become the way the world is, it does just become background noise. But if you're actually trying to provoke a response, you're actually trying to get people to do something or say something or believe in something, the more you push, the more it just becomes, oh, that's another person telling me to do or think something and I don't care anymore. Yeah. Because you live in, we live in such hyper-mediated uh, reality and such hyper-mediated lives that there's only so much effect any individual thing can have on us anymore because there's always something else to look at. There's always something else somewhere else for our attention to go. And so that actually creates a real quandary for them. The more they've tried to weaponize that process, the harder it's actually become to maintain the simplicity of emotionally resonant messaging that they want. So I'm actually quite optimistic about where this might go over the next 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm being naive. No, I, I think that mainstream media is at a, a very severe crossroads in this way that there's going to continue to be this kind of media that does continue to get picked up and they're going to have to do to comment on it in greater ways somehow, even if it's mostly subterfuge or just distractions, because they won't be, there won't be anything they can say in response anymore. There won't be, it's just, why hasn't the New York times done more extensive work on this or the post or it's going to become that question is yeah you guys and also th they don't want to ever seem like they're behind the times in keeping up with in in that way so though certainly they'll start off with stories that are much more linear much more uh, pick and choose and but after a while it was like tom because you guys get the actual fucking documents how do you argue with it once you've gotten to us oh this asshole did say this thing i guess you're not full of shit it's there. It's not like it's written in some, in just some novelization where they came up with stuff like this, but also, and I want to say, Tom, you've mentioned before too, that they really don't want 
any mention of the entertainment liaison office in any film or any fictional thing. They don't want to give it any kind of space to say this organization exists and may be affecting what you're walking, watching right now. Isn't that right? Yeah, they do tend to go out of their way to try and avoid. They do an awful lot with reality TV, for example. And you'd think it'd be very hard to make a reality TV show without kind of letting in on the fact that the military are basically there stood behind the cameras at the same time as the producers and everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, for example, there's the YouTubers, the Dude Perfect YouTubers. They did a Top Gun promotion where they go and mess around on an aircraft carrier for a couple of days. And that episode starts with a call from a naval commander saying, yes, we've approved you to come on board our aircraft carrier for a couple of days. And we've looked down the list of things that you want to do. And we'll try and make as many of them happen as we can. There might be a few that we can't thing. And it's, that's not what happens. Yeah. You don't go to the com naval commander. You go to the entertainment liaison office. You don't get that call from a commander. You get that call from an entertainment liaison officer. Because it's all handled through them. It's all handled through the PR people. So that first 30 seconds of that episode is a lie. And yeah. it's a lie to cover up how did this come about? Why is this being made? What is this thing? Even this 20 minute video that we're watching on YouTube. And I'm using that because it's a really stark example. And it's also because of what I was writing about earlier today. But there's tons of this sort of stuff where it's like, you, in order to find out that they even worked on a production, sometimes they're not even credited at the end of the film. They're not credited on a Suicide Squad. The James Gunn one from last year. There's a bunch of other government agencies, government of Panama, play other places that they've filmed or got tax credits from or whatever. They're credited, but not the DOD. We had to find that out through the documents. Why not? That's one of the biggest films of last year. That caused a great stir, but it seems that I, I was pretty much the only person who spotted that. And the only reason why I spotted it was because filing relentless freedom of information requests and going through piles of documents. Maybe we shouldn't have to find that out. Maybe we shouldn't have to do that in order to find out that the military made this film that's basically about glamorizing U.S. black operations in Latin America. Because that actually matters. That's still going on. That's been going on for 140 years, maybe longer. That's a big part of the history of Latin America and just of the relationships between the Americas in general. That's not something that should be promoted in a superhero movie by the government without us knowing about it. Surely. It Shouldn't be that difficult to find this crap out. It really shouldn't. Not that I'm complaining. I don't mind doing it. I'm just <laughs> What would you do, Tom, if, if it all came crashing down? And basically, we achieved the objective of making a much more democratic, less militarized Hollywood system. What would you do with your life? Oh, write about football. <laughs> My first and true passion. <laughs> it's only because of stuff like this that I'm not just doing something easy like writing about football. Because trust me, I'd, I can make a living doing that. I'm, I'm quite good at football commentary and stuff. But maybe I'll start doing that alongside this. But yeah, it would be something simple like that. Something nice. Because <laughs> honestly, reading about war crimes and then reading about movies and how the movies were rewritten to prevent the depiction of the war crimes being accurate, after a while, does wear on you psychologically. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> it's not the nicest way to spend lots and lots of your time but it is necessary so well fellas i think that's a, a great place for us to wrap it up for today thanks to you both for uh, coming and chatting with me about this i really enjoyed the discussion i'm sure our listeners will as well is there anything either of you guys would like to plug we'll make sure we have good links for the documentary and for national security cinema and then of course to tom's site matt i'll uh, i'll get with tom make sure we if i'm not sure i I think you have a site. I can't remember at the moment, but um. yeah, you can look me up on Bright with No Hands okay. on Facebook or look up my name, Matt Alford, on TikTok. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll make sure I include that stuff. But anything you guys want to plug before we wrap up? Oh, nope. basically just the documentary. We want people to watch Theatres of War because this has been a fun conversation. But trust me, if you watch that documentary, you'll be stunned by what we found and you'll be stunned by just how deep and how broadly this goes and just how much of our how much of the culture industry is influenced by this and we oh, devoted a hell of a lot of time and effort to making this documentary we want as many people to see it as possible we want to hear from people who've seen it whether positive or well, negative we are totally yeah. open to criticisms and counter arguments yes and because, because there will be a here. book of there will be a book of something similar that comes out of the documentary as well so having feedback on it would be great 
And also anyone who has read our 2017 book and thinks all of that, actually the research project that Roger led on for this for the last four or five years to make this documentary has been an incredible feat of, feat of work as well, alongside doing the document, uh, that, the actual technical side of the documentary as well. So there's a lot of new information in there, even for people who are fairly up to date with mine and Tom's work. All righty. I, I think I might, I might actually put out for the podcast that I'll, uh, I'll rent it for people for, I'll do it for five people or 10 people or something like that. But I, this is an absolutely needs, needs to be seen by as many people as possible documentary. And I want to, I definitely want to give it its due that way, but thank you both for your incredible work on it. It, it is, uh, it's something I need to go back and rewatch it and make really copious notes. Cause I know there was some stuff in there that I heard it. And then in the next, I was focused on the next thing. <laughs> and so it's, but, uh, but thank you guys both. And thank you for your time for chatting today. I appreciate it. Thank you ever so much. Thanks, man. Good talking to you. Good talking to you too. You guys take care and we will, we will talk again soon. Okay. Take care, man. Bye. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. I will not be